Hi, I'm Patrick Collins. I'm an Integrated Resources Analyst at Selco, and we're here at the 1830 Brick Schoolhouse today for an energy audit with the Center for Ecotechnology. This is Jamie. Um, and we are looking to do some weatherization work here and uh, air source heat pumps, and we're utilizing Community Preservation Act funds for this project. So I'm Jamie Overby. I'm with the Center for Ecotechnology. And as part of the energy audit today, I'm going to walk around from top to bottom and get a look at the thermal envelope, uh, as well as looking at lighting fixtures, uh, water fixtures, any sort of HVAC mechanicals that you have, uh, get an idea of what all the existing conditions are. And then based on what I see there, I can make some recommendations for weatherization upgrades, air sealing, equipment upgrades, things like that, and help you model what you would save if you made those improvements. And then I also can take some measurements and do some heating and cooling load calculations to help determine what size uh, systems you might need if you are interested in, in heat pumps and, and that kind of technology. Next, we're going to talk to Chris Gutherson with the Shrewsbury Historical Society to give us a background on the building. Welcome to the 1830 Brick Schoolhouse. I'm Chris Gustafson, Vice President of the Shrewsbury Historical Society. According to our research archives, the 1830 Brick School was built in 1830 for the cost of $330. This Greek Revival building is made of red brick and is located on Church Road opposite the town common. This is one of the earliest photographs of the building. The 1830 Brick Schoolhouse has historic significance because it's part of the Shrewsbury Historic District and is on the National Register of Historic Places. This building served as a school at the town center for more than a century. The students in the photograph at the right attended classes here around 1875. Notice some of the changes that have taken place over time. Originally, there was an L at the left. Then the L was removed. The front door was moved to the center with a porch. Later, the building was painted white. This building had other uses, including a second floor meeting hall for Civil War veterans and other groups. It served as a police station, superintendent's office, and credit union. Currently, it's the home of the Shrewsbury Historical Society. It was established in 1898. We also established the Town History Museum on the second floor, which is free and open to the public. We have meetings here, have a research archive, and collaborate with others for special events. Each year, we hold programs for the Yuletide Market and Spirit of Shrewsbury. As part of the Society's stewardship of the building, we've made many improvements. Here are a few examples. New roof, chimney, downspouts, windows, railings, steps, ramp, and signs. Inside, we've established the museum, painted, replaced the heating system, upgraded electrical and security systems. The Society is very excited for the next phase of improvements made possible by a CPA project by Selco and the Town of Shrewsbury and approved at town meeting. Thank you so much. First thing I'm noticing with the moisture, you do have a good bit of moisture infiltration and you can see where you start to have some uh, fungal growth. Um, just some, some mildew discoloring along the pipe wrap. There's some phosphorescence along the walls. Um, a good way to mitigate moisture is, you know, looking at grading, make sure the grading is sloped away from the building, um, making sure you have gutters, definitely uh, de gutters that discharge away from the building. Um, covering any sort of dirt floor, like this all appears to be dirt floor, so a lot of times once you kind of start mitigating the, how the water is getting in, um, you know, in New England we have damp basements regardless, so once you take care of those bigger issues then you can start thinking about putting down uh, a plastic vapor barrier. Helps a lot just to kind of mitigate uh, some of that moisture evaporation that really starts to affect the lifespan of, of the framing and the insulation and all of those things. Um, so I will definitely make sure to pay attention when we're walking around the outside to see kind of what you got going on out there in terms of where the water is getting in. Um, but a vapor barrier and, and dehumidification, gutters, grading can go a long way to help uh, minimize this. But you can tell it definitely it feels humid. We've had a really wet season, so it's probably a little extra right now. Um, but there's definitely some improvements you could make here. 
Is this the bulkhead that goes outside? Yes. I'm assuming. Okay. Alrighty. So it looks like all of the s steam pipes have some sort of insulation. It looks like no asbestos anymore. Has that all been mitigated in the past? I'm assuming. I presume so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then what I like to look at when I'm in a basement is if there's any sort of uh, rim joist, which is typically the framing that sits on top of the foundation. This is all kind of been plaster and lapped over. Um, so I'm not really going to be able to access any of that, but I can kind of at least see, you know, the condition that your subfloor is in and where this kind of sits along the, the rim. A lot of times the contractors can come in and Basically, any penetration to the outside where you have plumbing or electrical wires coming in, uh, you're going to get air infiltration. All that outside air wants to push in low uh, at the low end of the building and then find its way through open nooks and crannies and penetrations and work its way up the walls and into the attic. So what we really like to focus on in the basement, once moisture has been mitigated, is to look at how can we button this up and tighten this up so you don't have as much air infiltration into the basement. Um, so we would really kind of pay attention to the edges um, and then any sort of you know penetrations you have in the ceiling but there's not going to be much you can do here just because of this this is a metal lath and plaster um, covering over the framing here uh, this looks to be the boiler itself isn't too incredibly old i know it's a newer burner so yeah oil burns a little bit dirty so having it yeah every year serviced is a really good idea. Um, you know, ideally if we are able to get you guys set up with heat pumps, then you'll be relying on this a lot less, if, if at all. You know, heat pumps can, in fact, be the sole source of heating and cooling for your building if they're sized correctly. But did we um, this for backup? I would, it's not that old. Yeah. Um, you know, a steam boiler, you're, you're really not gonna get much more efficient than it is. Yeah, um, but uh, just to have it as a backup wouldn't hurt because it's not, you know, it's not an end of life yet. Hot water, is it heating your hot water? Do you have a separate hot water tank? So just a small electric tank. Yeah. And I see you've got a little bit of a sump pump here for your dehumidifier. Uh, do you know how old this dehumidifier is? Very old. I think it's as old as the museum. And do you ever clean the filter? Probably not. OK. No, see? Probably so, <laughs> um, dehumidifiers, uh, old dehumidifiers running a lot, especially this year we've had a really damp season. Um, they actually will drive up your electric bill quite a bit. So I typically recommend that uh, get if you're going to run them, get something that's Energy Star rated and sized for the space that it's in. Um, and then you do want to regularly clean these filters because this is working a lot harder than it needs to. So it's just it's that much more money to, to run. Um, most of the newer ones have um, automatic settings where you can set the humidity you want and leave it. Uh, they have alarms that go off when your filter needs to be changed periodically. Um, so I would definitely upgrade this, especially since, you know, it's, it's nice and hot. It's been running for a while. It's probably been running mm. for weeks and weeks on end, given all the rain that we've had. Um, so this is definitely worth an upgrade. <clears throat> so I'll make notes of that in my report as well. Uh, okay. Um, another thing to just in terms of moisture is if you've got the gutters and you've got the grading and there's not much more you can do. I mean, it's an old stone foundation. It's going to it's going to be a little leaky. Um, you could always look into having a French drain put in around the perimeter, which would help a lot just in terms of directing that moisture away. Um, you know, you can, you can tell the moisture has really started to affect some of your pipes. Uh, we've got a lot of rust, a lot of condensation, um, and that's just because it's just so damp down here. Um, and, and again, that, that can be fixed. So I do see you have a carbon monoxide detector, which is great. Um, one thing I'll mention, so, you know, there's definitely some opportunity for some air sealing. Uh, all around. One thing I'll mention is the um, 
the supports that you see here. Uh, most of them look like they're up on blocks, which is good. I, th I think there are a couple over here on blocks. I always try to keep an eye on those in older buildings that have damp basements like this. Right. Uh, the only reason is I have definitely been in places where when the moisture hasn't been taken care of, the bottom of these will rust out. And then all of a sudden it's not the support that you're expecting it to be. So just structurally keeping an eye on those. It seems like most of these are in pretty good shape. You can see some of the old original, you know, this was before they were doing true cut lumber. There's just a lot of old trees. <laughs> uh, so you can see a lot of these old logs holding some things up. Any of these small copper water pipes, the hot water line, you know, ideally you'd have a little bit of pipe wrap on this. Uh, any of the hot water lines, it looks like most of them are relatively accessible. Some of them are a little tight to the ceiling here, so you might not be able to, uh, to fit it, but I think you could definitely add some insulation to some of these hot water pipes as well. The electric tank, do we know how old it is? Sometimes there's a date. Having these drained annually is a really great idea. Um, it, a lot of people just kind of YouTube it and figure out how to do it themselves. Um, but any HVAC or plumber could do it. But ideally they drain it. You get a lot of uh, mineral deposits and, and calcium deposits that build up on this tank. They have these anode rods on the interior that is supposed to attract all of that to help uh, prolong the life of the tank. But those need to be swapped out every so often either. And I think generally, in my experience, most people don't know about that and they don't do it. Um, so when this goes, it's, you know, obviously it's small, but it will leak. Um, and if it's near end of life, it'd probably be a good idea looking at a replacement and then just doing some annual or every other year, flush it, take, take a peek at your anode rods to make sure that they're not too crusty. Um, there are some great heat pump technologies for hot water as well. I don't know, you know, you'd kind of have to look at your water usage and whether or not it would be cost effective for you. The initial install of, of a heat pump hot water heater is a bit more expensive. You might not need that, um, but I will say you have a great setup for it. You've got some residual heat off your steam pipes. There's not anybody working down here on the regular because it will make the space a little bit colder. Um, so that's just an option and I can kind of list some other options for you too when I send you your report. And then all the lighting, again, it's not on very often, but you might as well upgrade it. I would say um, even motion sensors. So you don't have to worry about flipping them off and on. Just have, have them all on a, on a sensor. And when someone comes down here, they need it. And, they, and if they, you don't have to worry about anybody forgetting and leaving them on. So um, let's hold on one second. Let me see this here before we head upstairs. What do we got going on here? So at one point was collecting water, it looks like. All right, let's make our way up. Let's keep working our way up. We do kind of look at fixtures just in terms of low flow. Make sure you have a, a low gallon per minute. Low priority for you guys here because, you know, you just have this half bath. Is there a kitchen on the premise? Okay, so we'll look at that as well. Um, but it looks like most of the lighting in here could be upgraded as well. Uh, let's go make our way up if we can. I'm okay. To the left. Oh, we'll a small kitchen in here. I see you have the one uh, mercury switch thermostat. So programmable thermostats I'll definitely recommend. Um, you can set a five, two day program. You can set it up however it works best for you. But dropping the temperature in the evening, anywhere from seven to 10 degrees, not drastically because you don't want everything to have to reheat up, but a programmable thermostat will save you quite a bit. If you end up putting in uh, heat pumps, particularly because you're going to have to do ductless here, they will have individual remote controls. But if you're keeping that oil boiler, they're going to want to put in some integrated controls. So, you know, on the coldest days of the year, they might have that oil system kick on. Again, if they're sized appropriately, not really necessary, but a lot of folks opt to do that. Um, so why I would typically say get programmable thermostats, in your case, I might say wait until you figure out what you're doing with the HVAC, and then that might all be included in that quote. Uh, there are places, a lot of hardware stores, Rockies, Ace hardware types that collect these mercury switch thermostats and dispose of them appropriately. So when the time comes, you can, there's uh, likely a handful of places around here that would accept them. So this is just a mini fridge in a sink. So no like uh, gas or no um, 
electric or propane like kitchen appliances. So, okay. <clears throat> exterior doors, let's look at your exterior doors. So you have an insulated half light. Uh, you do have some weather stripping, it's in pretty decent shape. Um, you might do with a sweep on the exterior. And then also these thresholds can be adjusted. So you have these little screws in here that, you know, do you mind if I shut this door if I open the, I'm just gonna do this, those here. Just kind of want to see how your seal is. So I like to just kind of stand back and make sure you have a nice tight seal with your weather stripping and that you don't see any daylight coming through. There's a little bit of a gap here. Real um, easy fix for that is these little caps pop off. Two of them are missing. You can actually adjust how high that threshold is. It could afford to be a little bit tightened. And another solution for that is just adding a sweep at the bottom. So over time, as it adjusts, you have a little bit of a sweep. Helps minimize your drafts. Okay, I'm gonna come in here. And I looked, so you have, and this corner, is this a, AC or a dehumidifier? Dehumidifier. Okay. Those are new. Okay, great. So it's just the two ACs upstairs. And it's a dehumidifier upstairs. Also. Okay. And that's a newer Energy Star dehumidifier, so you're in good shape there. <clears throat> you have um, masonry f walls with the brick veneer on the exterior. There's probably a lot of original plaster walls left in this building. A lot of times when I come into a building, I'm looking at insulation opportunities for the walls. In a building like this, you wouldn't really be able to make much of an upgrade. Um, typically, especially in the age that it was built, uh, you, you likely have no vapor barrier between the brick and the wall cavity. So we wouldn't recommend kind of retroactively going back and dense pack any sort of cellulose or anything like that just because uh, it's going to degrade quicker just because there is no vapor barrier to get moisture. Um, but with the plaster and the uh, masonry and then the brick veneer, you're, you're probably in okay shape. It's not like it would make a huge difference. I would say your priorities are the attic and then the basement. So if we can make our way up, are these, what are these sensors here? These uh, smoke and motion detectors. Motion detector. So this room is, uh, the lights are motion detector? No, this is for security reasons. Oh, security only. Okay. So yeah, again, depending on how you use the space, um, timers or, or motion sensors for the lighting can be a really great idea in certain spaces as well. All right. I'm going to make my way upstairs. I see uh, a lot of tiling in the ceiling. I'm curious, is there old plaster ceiling under this tiling? Okay. A lot of times when I see this, it just tells me that there was some plaster that wasn't in the best shape and it's a really nice way to kind of cover it up. Um, so we'll take a look at that. When I get to the attic side, I might be able to tell what's behind it. We have another exterior insulated door here. There's an alarm on this door. This has weather stripping that's in decent shape as well. And that threshold is nice and tight. So with the window ACs, um, I can actually, I'm just gonna take a picture of this tag because I can model about what you would save if you got rid of these and were heating or cooling with the um, heat pumps. Do you know how many of these you have in the building? Just these two. Just those two. Okay. One and one, and those are the only ones. Okay. And they are, uh, they look to be identical.
These halogens put off a lot of heat. So getting uh, LED replacements for the track lighting would cool it off in here a little bit. <clears throat> So I, this, it's an interesting building in that I see so I can look where the flooring ends and I can see a gap into the wall cavity and I can actually feel cooler air pouring up here. Um, so uh, it, figuring out an appropriate way to air seal this would be a really great idea. I imagine in the winter, this just blasts cold air into this space. And it looks to go all down the perimeter. And I imagine potentially on that side, but that's a huge leaky spot for you. Okay. Yeah, there's, so there's all of our evidence of knob and tube, but there's absolutely no insulation up here at all. So we have a, a bit of a, there's about a three feet ceiling difference, height, ceiling height difference here. Um, so I can't see into the tippy top, but based on what I see in this section, you know, there's definitely some old knob and tube. Like I said, I think most of this is deactivated, but um sometimes contractors will have you have a sign off form just to verify that because every now and then they'll find a live wire that's kind of hidden spliced in somewhere i doubt you'd find that here but yeah you have kind of some non-standard framing just due to the age of the building and some old plaster and laths that's what that tile down there is covering up so that's going to be Number one priority, biggest bang for your buck, getting insulation put up there. And it's a nice, huge space, plenty of room to move around. Um, it's just empty. So, <clears throat> you know, even just the hatch, like, you know, get, getting it insulated, getting the hatch insulated. You have a little bit of a, right here, where the ceiling height bumps out. Is, a, is this wall also that is a weak spot. So they would actually, from the attic side, insulate this wall that runs across here. Um, but that would, that's, I, I imagine once I model this building, that is going to be your best payback is to insulate that attic. So, and then uh, this is one room I didn't see. I wanna peek in here. Insulating above this, I mean, this room is incredibly hot because you have absolutely no insulation upstairs or in the walls. The walls you can't treat so much with the age and style of this building, but the attic is a really easy fix. Uh, air sealing and insulating that attic is really going to help you regulate the temperature in here. Um, due to the fact that it is closed off and locked most of the time, you know, if you're retrofitting the space with many splits, distribution wise, it's not really going to help in here. But a lot of times for these small areas, you can have you know, a small strip of electric resistance or some small uh, solution just for this room that you can talk to an HVAC contractor about. Um, but the biggest thing that's gonna help regulate the temperature and humidity in this space is air sealing and insulating that attic. So it'll make a big difference. So in terms of just kind of looking at your thermal envelope and the mechanics, I've seen what I need to see. What I'd like to do is I'm gonna go back down to the first floor and just take a ton of measurements and work my way up. I believe all of the windows in here are the exact same size, um, so that will make it go a little bit quicker. Um, so really what I wanna do is just measure the separate spaces. So I'll just do that really quick. I can start up here and, and go through and do that. Once I get all my measurements, I'll be able to model the building with its existing conditions and tell you what the heating and cooling load is for every individual space. That will help any contractor you work with figure out what size equipment to put in. Um, it's called a manual J calculation. Yep, correct? a manual J calculation. For commercial spaces, um, it's called an, a manual and we use a, a, a similar software, but it takes into account occupancy. I, I have a feeling I'm gonna treat this more as a residence just because you're not open 
you know, like a regular weekday nine to five. So what I look for when I walk around the exterior at the end is really I'm just kind of getting an idea for what kind of shape is everything in. I see they've got some gutters. They've got the gutter terminations that are actually pointing away so you're not getting water buildup. This could be a bit of a, a potential issue in grading wise just because the way that it slopes, especially with the heavy rain we've been getting, you probably get a good bit of standing water here. I think the fact that the outside granite has been redone probably helps a lot. But just in terms of water, uh, like the, the water table in the ground, just right here, it's probably a bit of a, a tough spot. When we went down into the basement, I believe this was the dampest area of the basement, was this corner. A lot of times I'll be looking for um, vent terminals, things like that. This, this building will really potentially only have one for that downstairs bathroom. But you know, all this is graded away from the building, which is what you want to see. You have, um, you know, some of the, the wood fascia and the soffit up here could use some painting um, just to kind of prevent rot. It doesn't look like it's in bad shape. It just looks like the painting needs to be redone. Is the chimney redone? Yeah, mm -hmm. looks brand new. And then this is what I want to see for the bathroom. So we saw there was a bath fan and then here is the port where that bath fan exhausts that, that, that air, which is what we want to see. We don't want that going back into the ceiling or into the building. In terms of the moisture mitigation, the only real area that could potentially use some improvement is that that back area where the bulkhead was. That's where you're gonna get pooling water. That was the dampest spot. But in everything else that you could do, gutters, draining, it all looks really, really good. So it'll be a matter of vapor barriers, dehumidification, um, potentially some spray foam. There are a couple different ways you could approach that basement, so. And that's all, that's all I really need to see. It's a cool building. I, I, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to come and walk around and take a look at it. Thanks, Jamie. We just wrapped up our energy audit. Uh, it's going to really inform the best next steps for us here at the schoolhouse. Um, and we do offer free residential energy audits for our customers. And you can check it out on nextzero.org or call 888-333-7525. Yeah. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come out and take a look at this really cool old building. Um, and I will send you guys a follow-up report with your heating and cooling load calculations and any recommendations for energy efficient upgrades that I find. Thank you.